Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. This is our Biofuels in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Join us each week as we explore biofuels in Hawaii and our interviews with some of the various local stakeholders to learn about policy, feedstock, and conversion processes. Today, our guest is Mr. Kyle Dada, General Partner of Ulupono, uh, the Ulupono Initiative, a Hawaii-focused impact investing firm founded by Piero Midiar uh, that uses for-profit, non-profit, and social investments to improve the quality of life for island residents in three areas specifically, locally produced food, clean, renewable energy, and waste reduction. Previously, Mr. Dada was the CEO of U.S. Biodiesel Group, a national biodiesel firm, managing director of research and consulting at the Rocky Mountain Institute, and a vice president of Booz Allen Hamilton, where he was the managing partner of the firm's Asia Energy practice and later led the U.S. utilities practice. Uh, Mr. Dada holds a bachelor's of science, uh, master's in environmental science in resource, uh, in resource economics and master's in public and private management degrees from Yale uh, University. So I honestly cannot think of a more qualified person to help us learn more about and develop biofuels here in Hawaii. So welcome to the show. Great to be here, Carl. So excellent. So um, let's start off a little bit. Tell us a bit more about why you have decided that biofuels, going back to your education, why did you start to choose biofuels? What led you in that direction? Well, we, when you look at alternatives uh, for renewable energy in the entire energy system, one of the areas you get to after you look through electricity is transportation as well as for both ground transportation and aviation and marine. And obviously you want to make things more efficient first. Uh, and we have the electrification of vehicles to address the gasoline market. But eventually you're going to have to address aviation fuels and that leads you down the biofuels path. Uh, as well as I think there's uh, clearly some diesel applications in a lot of areas where biofuels already works very well with the engine manufacturers. Okay, okay. So that has, that, that sparked your interest and that led you into wanting to pursue from an educational perspective, environmental perspective, and then down the road, how to pull it all together. So that's, right. that's where you are right, right now. So when I was at Booz Allen, you know, I led a lot of strategic work for the major oil companies all over the world, actually. And so we, we monitored and tracked biofuels and the progress of the industry at that point from that point and actually spurred some of the companies to start making sort of informational investments in the space. Uh, when I was at Rocky Mountain Institute, we did an extensive study on how to uh, eliminate uh, oil from the transportation sector for actually the Pentagon of, of strategic services. Uh, and that was winning the oil end game that really uh, led to a lot of thinking around changing uh, the whole transportation sector. And a lot of the carbon and lightweight vehicles you see today come from the early work but also biofuels played a role there. And then uh, I became CEO of US Biodiesel Group, which then merged into the Renewable Energy Group to kind of create the number one biofuels company in the States, which then went public a few years back. So we've looked at it for, I've really had a career that's touched it in many different levels. And then in Hawaii, we recognize that, you know, we do use a lot more jet fuel than most states per capita because of course the tourism economy and while we're doing tremendously on the electrical power side, and obviously have a goal of 100%, which is groundbreaking uh, nationwide, by 2045, we are going to have to address the other parts of the barrel. Yes, uh, which is an important point because, as, uh, so that I'm not the one always saying it, we, per barrel, what's the percentage per barrel that goes towards electricity versus transportation? Well, it's really about... In, a, in Hawaii. Yeah, in Hawaii. It's about a third of the barrel that goes to electricity. The other two-thirds go to transportation. Actually, jet fuel, which is remarkable, is about a third of our of our sort of, of the barrels we bring in. So it's a very, very important thing to address. And of course, it's harder because you're flying a plane as opposed to driving a truck. So the standard for the fuel is higher. It has to go through a lot more certifications and yes. the quality of that fuel is higher, which means there's a lot more refinement of it, which creates certain challenges uh, as you're moving from uh, biochemistry of sort of biologically derived fuels into a substitute for that quality of petroleum fuel. Right, right. So it, with those specifications, we're referring to ASTM, Correct. the ASTM standards, yeah. and there are several of them. There's, uh, for example, D1655, which is, a, uh, I guess, a fairly new one that is trying to address the various pathways, or one of the ones that's trying to address the various current pathways to incorporate 
biofuels into, at least on a mixture basis, right. uh, at the moment. Right. So, um, yes, and that's one of the huge steps, the yes. fact that we have yes. those. Um, I believe there are five current pathways that are approved. And that, uh, if I understand correctly uh, from CAFI, there's another 18 that are being pursued. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, uh, finding ways to connect that to what we're able to grow and produce here. Correct. Is, is one of the, I guess, challenges that we have. That's right. And that's a lot of what Ulupono has been doing for the last seven years is addressing that challenge. We've made a, a series of investments in a series of companies to actually go down each of the major pathways. And if you sort of stand back and think about it, there's, there's a, uh, an oils pathway, right? We take oils and turn them into a biodiesel, and, right. and which is already a transportation fuel, but then you do a little more work to the biodiesel, it becomes an aviation fuel. And that's a pretty proven pathway. There's a sugars to alcohol pathway. You can get sugars from, of course, sugar, yeah. or plants that produce sugar. Or you can get sugars from trees, but you have to, to hide go through hydrolysis to get the sugars out of the, out right. of the cellulose, another pathway, but again, that actually pathway has proven uh, commercially effective. Alt, I think Alt Air is running yes. an alcohols-based system now for transportation, so that pathway is there, but it goes back to our ability to produce cheap sugars here. Welcome to uh, right. And then there's, uh, there's the, the pathway, of course, of taking uh, woody matter and turning it into a gas, and then going through the old chemistry of Fischer Troth, which was developed by the Germans and improved by the South Africans, was actually quite effective. Uh, and that also can produce a jet fuel. So we've actually made investments in each of these. And then algae is just another way of getting oil, but with a much more uh, highly productive species than a terrestrial plant. So we've I'm made a glad couple of investments that in algae. Up, actually, we do have the Kauai algae farm, which I, I'm hoping gets to remain and we can get to continue Indeed. developing that. I'm not sure where we are with that. There's lots of conversations. I would like to learn about that, but I think it's being held quiet at the moment as they're figuring it out. But the thing about algae is it's a significant, it's an exponential yield. Correct. Correct. And that's an important thing to think about. How In Hawaii, we have to be practical that we don't want to reinvent the old debate of, of food versus fuel. We don't have to do that here. That's an old debate, but we actually can do it right here. So what does that mean? You, you don't, you want to think through the yields and you don't want to use your primary cultural land if you can avoid it for these kinds of things. So, you know, if, if conventional uh, oils from soybeans, that's about 60 gallons an acre, maybe 80 with, if you use, you know, better seeds like canola, you know, corn, you can get around, you know, 100, you can get to 400 with oil seed palms, uh, but you really want to sort of jump to a different level. I mean, the, the advanced sugars and all the advanced canes, there might be a thousand gallons yeah. an acre. But when you get to algae, you're starting at a thousand and you're shooting for 10,000. Exactly. And that's what you're shooting for. And you can see, and if you look at all the work that was done in the last five years, you can actually see a pathway to affordable jet fuel. The work that was done in Kauai, which DARPA reviewed, says there's a pathway to $2 a gallon jet fuel. And that's sort yes. of the magic, the military magic number. number. Right. But they can see the pathway for that type of technology. So we know the pathways there. Uh, there was also good work done on some of the cellulosic fuels. The, the work we did investing in with Rentec uh, to upgrade the fuel, clear fuels technology, which was a, a syngas technology for wood married to Rentec's very good uh, Fisher Trost technology. So actually that, that work, which was we funded with Rentec and of course the Obama administration, uh, put a lot of money into this, work technically well. So there's, so we know that chain works. Uh, At what scale? At what scale was that? Well, and that's, and that, I think, the, that's the other issue we had to talk about in Hawaii. So what's the minimum scale you need uh, to produce, in terms of land basis yeah. to fund one of these biorefineries? And what's the kind of capital cost? And what does that mean to put the chain together? Because yeah. all these things are interrelated. Uh, so in general, uh, our view at Ulupono is you have to be able to build an end-to-end -end chain with a series of contracts that make it investable for not just us, but more importantly for the banks. Right. So there has to be a series of contracts that do that. And I will give the utility credit because one of the things that they did was step up to the following challenge. When you're building uh, a re biorefinery, you need to take about 10, more like 20 years to get the capital back. You start getting your money back for real about year 12 or 15. Uh, so you have to have very long-term contracts for the fuel. Uh, 
the military at best goes out five years. The airlines go out one or two years. Uh, good to have contracts, but they're really short duration. Only the utility stepped up and said, we will at least start the conversation. Actually, got a, we got one or two, we got one approved for 20 years, a 20 year contract. So that's, that's, that's HECO. That was HECO, our utility. Our utility and that here. was an important thing because even though that's not the highest and best use for the biofuel molecule, it does allow the first ones, the first plants to be commercially Absolutely, financed. Absolutely, because you need to have that right. path all the way right. through. So yes. that was a very big step. So Good. they did that step. The Obama administration, if you think back, uh, put in an enormous amount of money, as did the Europeans. And actually the Japanese put in some too, in three different sort of technology initiatives linked together to really push down the advanced biofuels pathways. So a lot of money was spent. Uh, billions actually across the world. And a fair amount of private capital was spent and some oil companies like Shell stepped up and also put real money into this. So there was a lot of work done and we did benefit from a bunch of that. We, we yeah. brought a number of technology projects into the state. The two algae projects were part of that, the one on Kauai, but also Solana, which was a Shell joint right. venture right. on the big island. Of those two, Solana has survived. It's still yes. in business, which is a credit to their CEO. Uh, the, uh, you know, we did do the clear fuels venture, which was a homegrown technology here that married to a, a mainland larger company, and that whole pathway was funded, and in fact it worked. So we did a lot of work the last round, which is over the last five years. Now, one of the things that happened, it didn't come to full commercial fruition because oil prices dropped. Yes. By the time the technologies worked, the oil prices dropped, and that's an important reality of the chain. So the, the biofuels chain, much like the solar chain, it started at a relatively high price. And as you know, the story of solar over a, a series of about a decade, a decade and a half, it really started to drop. And then the Chinese and the Europeans and the Americans scaled it up. Yep. And now it's ubiquitous and it's, it's completely a grid parity, especially here. Especially here. So it's yes. a good story. So you look at biofuels today and you can wring your hands. And say, oh, it's so expensive. But, but actually, the way to sort of think about it at a very simple level is that even if it takes sort of the last five years pre of the Obama work and the, the work of the Europeans, and the, but right around the time of the first, the last big oil spike, where as you know, oil hit 145. Right. When we started that journey, oil fuels were about unsubsidized, about $200 a, bar a barrel. They're in that range, yeah. there are a lot of them were short in that range of cost. Right. So for all the money we spent in the public and private sector, what did we get it down to unsubsidized? We got down to about 100. 25, sometimes 110, sometimes 100. Unsubsidized. Unsubsidized. Okay, Which so we got that. That's extraordinary. That's extraordinary. Yeah. We, we did a lot of work. So we got to that place. Now there's a $40 uh, a barrel subsidy, a dollar a gallon, so it's 42 to be precise. That brings it down to about 80. About 80. So had the oil prices stayed at 100. That's a federal subsidy. Yeah, the federal subsidy. Yeah. So okay. at, had oil prices stayed at 100, then some of the projects that we've just been talking about would be commercial today. They would be under okay. operation, they okay. would be building. So they're currently being stalled well, or, or have for, failed? No, for, well, they, they've, they probably, I'd say, are either stalled or, or failed or got to go to round two. But because even as we dropped the cost curve, of course, the price of oil dropped faster because oil's cyclical. Yes. And we went to a, a, one of these deep cycles where it's very inexpensive. Will it come back? Yeah, it tends to. So if you look it over the last 100 years, real. it tends to kind of rise and well, fall. I recently heard that they're already talking about affecting the, the, the uh, product out of OPEC they're going to start reducing numbers, so therefore prices will start to go back up again anyway. But there's another piece of the economics which I think is as important for us to understand, which is what is the value of long-term fixed prices? I mean, all Excellent. of us know that if we were to try to purchase something in the future at a fixed price, we'd have to pay a premium for that. Right, right. So let's jump into that. Let's yeah. take a quick break. Okay. We're already at our first quick, uh, break here. Uh, so I, I said it happens really quickly, right? <laughs> so, okay, thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. We're doing our Biofuels in Hawaii series. And thank you to our guest, Mr. Kyle Dada from Ulupono Initiative. And we will see you in one minute. Thank you. Do you want me to shorten the answers? I can't. Oh, no, don't, don't worry. Don't worry. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Thanks for watching Think Tech this summer. We have a lot of terrific shows of great importance, and I hope you'll watch my show too every Tuesday at noon as we address sustainability issues for Hawaii. They're really pertinent as the World Conservation Congress approaches in September, and the World Youth Congress that's focusing on sustainability next year as well. Have a great summer, and tune in at noon every Tuesday. 
Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, ThinkTechHawaii.com. I appear on Mondays at 3 o'clock, and my gig is Energy Efficiency, Doing More With Less. It's the most cost-effective way that we in Hawaii are going to achieve 100% clean energy by the year 2045. I look forward to being with you. Aloha. Aloha, welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. We are doing our Biofuels in Hawaii series, and today our guest is Mr. Kyle Dada from Lupono Initiative. So we were just talking about, well, we were starting to get into some of the economic aspects of biofuels. So let's jump back into that as far as uh, we were talking about the pricing and the hedging aspect. So let's, okay. let's jump back into so that. Let's, let's just say with subsidies, we were able to get biofuels down to $80 a barrel but the price today is more like 40 or $50 a barrel. So we see that gap and say, well, is, is it uneconomic? So part of the question is, well, that $80 a barrel, that's a, we can make that the same price every year for the next 20 years. And so that's, there's a value to that hedge. It's a huge so value. What's, exactly, so what's that value worth? So we've been doing a work with the University of Chicago for the power sector, but looking at hedges in oil and natural gas, which are derivative of our power sector. And so even if you go out 10 years, the premiums at least 30, if not 40 percent. It should go out 20 or 30 years, of course, it escalates dramatically. And so you may see premiums almost the point of doubling the price, yeah. right? That's how the premiums go when you get to this 20 or 30 year point. So when you look at the hedge economics, you're saying, wait a second, that's actually in the money. Yeah. And that insight is why, now go back to why would the PUC approve uh, the Hawaii Bioenergy uh, contract way back in the day when it was a, probably being priced around $100 a barrel because as they looked forward, they were to say, wait a second, $100 a barrel was a great deal for 20 years. And in fact, it was a phenomenal deal. It was an uh, incredibly cheap hedge. And that's exactly just like we're doing with solar today. We're actually buying fixed price contracts and wind. So biofuels is, should get the same treatment. So from looking at that perspective, we're pretty close to being the money now, but there's other issues we have to talk about. So one is scale. Scale, exactly. So for the different types of choices, what's the minimum efficient scale? And that really talks about land commitment. So if you go down... Minimum efficient scale. So land commitment. So you're talking about yield of what you're able to right. get. What you're able Given, to produce, the right. yield you're getting out of it, and how, how much fuel is produced. And, well, at, and at what... That's right. Well, and if you look at it more like, uh, given the underlying agricultural realities of how much either oils, sugars, or uh, wood you can get from an acre of land, how many acres do you need to make sure that the processing unit you're putting in place has enough fuel to operate, right, right to create fuel, has the feedstocks. And, that's, and there's a minimum efficient scale to those processing units. So that's what defines it. Uh, otherwise, they just become wildly expensive when you make them too small. Right, right. So, uh, so for forestry, that's about 15,000 acres. So if you can look around the state and say, I need 15,000 acres that are all together, and that brings you to a handful of places. There's a couple of places on Kauai. There's a couple of places on the Big Island. Yeah. Okay. I would think Big Island has more space. They, they, have, they have a few places, but a few yeah. places that have, you know, again, of the yield you need, okay. 15,000 yeah. acres of contiguous land. When you get down to some and of this these... This is woody. These are trees. Yeah, these are trees. These are like yeah. eucalyptus trees like you see in Hamakua or right. Pahoa. And they, they grow very, very well, but there could be other trees. Right. Uh, and you can do grasses too, but you still need that amount. When you get to uh, some of the sugars, uh, you're, you could probably do it at five to 8,000. You're happier at 10,000, so it's a little <laughs> bit less. Yeah. But you can do some things with sugars that you know, allow you to uh, shrink the scale somewhat. And some crops like you know, cassava are very, very high yield. It was one of our investments in FICAL was the, for right. the high yield sugars. So you can sort of see a path forward that says, you know, we could probably do some of this. Uh, but when you get to algae, here's what's amazing. So algae, the minimum scale, is about 100 acres. You get 100 wow, acres, that's an order of magnitude difference. And, and you don't have to use, as you were talking earlier in the previous segment, you don't have to use higher quality or class right. A, class B that's right. ag land. That's right. Because when you get to the, the forest, you actually can do on the forestry lands that doesn't necessarily have to intersect with the class A, class B. Right. The sugars, you've got to use class A, class B. They will right. not grow without that kind of quality of land. The algae can really be grown on, on 
because it's basically concrete raceways anywhere, including on a lava field, literally. Exactly. And in fact, Sol Solana is on a lava field, but it loves it there. Exactly. It's right always, Kona. It was yeah. always sunny, and, yeah. and then they're happy next to power plants, so Wyanai is a great place. I mean, think where yeah. we, we put our power plants in marginal places, so it's a good place to put the algae next to it, because it wants the CO2. It's also good for a distribution channel. Right, right. Which is why we've made a series of investments in the algae technologies. And again, they, they, they've gone far, they've proven out. Uh, the fuel alone will not pay for it. Often now you need the byproducts or other products, either proteins or you need right. some of the phytochemicals. So we, but we, that technology is still alive and well. And what we envision is, even though oil prices are low now, they're going to come back up. And so what we really need to talk about is what do we need to do to get ready for the next round? So that right. when, given all the money we spent exactly. and okay. all the stuff we've done in Hawaii, how do we do that? That is, that's huge, because that is, that's a big piece of a number of studies that are going on right now, specific to tropic, subtropic zones, Hawaii, Correct. specific to the Hawaii region and the Pacific region. What can be grown here and in what yields in order to, to create enough product? Uh, we've heard from um, Defense Logistics Agency, DLA, say that, well, what they need is what's called operational volume. So, okay, how many, how many gallons, how many millions of gallons per year do they need in order to really make it something that they can begin to purchase. Because you're right, they were telling us that they'll, they'll purchase like a year or two years of a contract when in, it, it behooves everyone if you've got a longer term, but only at a good price. Right. So, so yes, that's a very important piece, first of all, just to wrap that up, a very important piece to understand. And you can understand that simply by looking at your home operational budgets. When you know, okay, I'm paying this much for my rent or mortgage, I'm paying this much for my car, this much for my insurance, and it's a static number versus, oh, my electricity bill just went up this month. That's Why? Right. That's right. And you're realizing, oh, well, that has a direct impact on the price of oil, and that's where that comes in. And that's the connection that not a lot of people feel immediately or even connect to this, to this conversation. That's right. that's right. So, okay, now let's get to... Um, let's talk about scale and then the challenges. Okay. So scale, re, how we achieve the scale, because I know there have been a number of, and this is what we're really talking about is production scale, so how do we produce more and more and more and, and, and the number of acres we need, but then also the technologies. And where are the technologies and how advanced are they? Are they ready to get to that good, next scale? That's, that's a good question. So because we've invested in, in essentially all the different technologies. We, we have a point of view on this. So uh, to everyone's credit, especially the Europeans, but also the Americans, we've put a lot of money into the cellulosic pathway, which is the woody pathway. And even though we spend half a billion dollars collectively each on scaling these up to full commercial, when we scaled them up, they didn't work. They, they just didn't work. Yours didn't work. Uh, Corin didn't work. Uh, there's, there's still more challenges in the integration of all these pieces. So we recognize that that's going to take yet another round. So that means that we have to understand where we are with that. We know the sugar to alcohol pathway works just great. And we know the alcohol to jet pathway works just great. We know the, the oil, oil yeah. right. And we know the oils work as well. So, so both those pathways work. In the oils, if we know algae made a huge set of strides technically, but we, we pretty much got them to sort of the, the five acre scale. And you've got to take those same modules and not bring them to the 20-acre scale. And then from the 20-acre scale, you can go to the 100-acre scale. When you're at the 100-acre scale, you're actually at a point where you're, you're, you're uh, economically self-sufficient. It starts to make sense. And then you can clone the 100 acres. So that's the pathway we're on. So the next round is going to be that sort of the 20 and the 100. And one of the questions that is under debate right now you know, as an investor is, are the other non-energy pieces, the proteins, the animal feeds, the, the kind of nutraceuticals, the phytochemicals, yeah. are those enough to invest in the 20-acre scale so that while we're waiting, we've gotten that scale done so that we're ready for the 100-acre scale? Because right. if we can see our way through to that, that would be an enormous step up. So that's one of the challenges we have right now, right. Is, is doing that study or getting those studies to show us it's that the a, ancillary products, right. the well, secondary products... The markets products are, are there. there. It's really the investment. It's, okay. it's, I, think I, I think what happened with algae is it proved itself enough, some of these companies did pretty well, that it really is the next round of investment in a low energy market. So energy's not driving it, right. but so it has to be all the other, I and mean, all the other markets are there, they're conventional markets. It's really getting to the next stage. So our thinking is that's likely to happen in the next five years, which will then set us up if you sort of take a look at, at the energy markets. You say, say likely. 
what needs to happen? So that's my next question here is, what are the barriers? What, what needs to happen as we begin to lay that plan out over the next five years to be able to be there? From, from the private sector, it's, it's really about risk and reward. Uh, you know, it's not, that, it's not about government subsidies per se for some of these investments, at least in the algae sector. For the, the public sector, and what can the public sector do, there's a couple of things that will make a big difference. You know, one is, on the military side, which has the greatest need and the greatest desire, there's really uh, an issue of can they see forward to doing five or 10 year contracts? Can they understand the value of the hedge and build that into their procurement system? Much like the utility did and the PUC did, they took the first step. If the military followed suit, that would change the game in terms of how the investors view the world. Uh, and that's a very, very important thing. I don't think we can ask the airlines to do it because... It well, they're already doing it. The airlines are already on a voluntary basis yes. internationally. Yes, they're buying it, but this is about, this is about buying long-term contracts right. at known fixed prices at, at volume and scale. And the military is more suited for that because yes. uh, they have a, a, a higher need yes. in terms of why they really want this fuel. And the power companies similarly were able to sort of see through it, like we think about solar and how that's a hedge. They were able to understand that equivalence. Yes. The military... In the next five years, that work would be very, very important. If, and if, especially yeah. in the Pacific, it could be a, a good region because of our special needs here to actually demonstrate that. And I know that they are very interested in trying to drive that. There's a number of studies being done in multiple facets of this that, that, that they're driving. The other thing that really matters at the state level is actually, ironically, not the subsidy. It's about water. Water. You, okay. you can't... Uh, for most crops, you can't grow them without water certainty. So here you have HCNS, obviously a, a perfect place to grow a number of crops at the right scale, with no water certainty. So who's going to make a 20-year investment when the underlying certainty of water supply yeah. is at best year, year to year? So ultimately adjudicating what's a very political, thorny issue that no one wants to sort of touch but really needs to be resolved, I think is very important, not just for biofuels, for all of agriculture. So, Getting final clarity, making the hard calls, and whatever we're going to make the calls on how we allocate our water and which way we do that to all the important needs that are there. We honor and respect all the needs, but eventually we have to make some decisions. That's very important because that unlocks large amounts of contiguous land. Yes. Uh, otherwise, you're back to the forest, and you're sort of banking on the forest and the algae, which are essentially less proven pathways. So you have more technology proving. If you could commit the water, you can go down the proven pathways, and then it's just a question of contracting which then you look to the military or you have to go back to the utility uh, and look at the long-term value of, of fixed price contracts and the numbers will start to work. So, yeah. so we're that so close. We can begin to see, yeah, we, we, can, we can see that we're, we're getting closer and closer. There are still some barriers we need to overcome and conversations that need to be had and yeah. some of them are challenging conversations. Uh, but the opportunities are there, the investors are there looking for that opportunity. That's right. The landowners are being engaged and we're trying to find those right. stakeholders to contribute as well yeah. in the whole picture. So, And there's one other way we can, we can make a decision about this, and I know PAR Petroleum is open to it, which is we have been focused on what I call pure play biofuels. So you're, you're taking, you're doing all the work to create little mini refineries, which in normal economic oil scale, they're, they're dots yeah. on the map. I mean, not even, they're just small little pinpoints. So they're very uneconomic in a certain degree, sense. If we thought about it differently and said, you know what, here's how much, we know we use 700 million gallons of jet fuel a year. If we're lucky, we could produce maybe 100 million gallons of this stuff, which would be great. Uh, so rather than force the pure play, if we could say, you know what, why don't we use refineries and have them do the refining and, and blend in the feedstocks and say, no, that's okay. In yeah. terms of our resilience, what we've done, we've actually decreased our oil dependency and we don't have to spend a lot of money on the downstream transformation. Remember I told you, Every time you go up to the higher, higher qualities, you have to have, you have, to have higher quality fuels. That costs a lot of capital. Absolutely. No, it does. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. I've, I wish we had a lot more time, but thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's uh, Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, uh, this, the Biofuels in Hawaii series. Again, thank you to Mr. Kyle Dada for joining us. We will see you next week. Thank you to the entire staff and the entire crew of Think Tech Hawaii. See you next week.